I want to just show that clustering services is my daily nightmare, actually, with two kids now, shopping, schools, and work, and everything. So, thank you for the, the efforts. So, I'd like to call Abiman, Abiman Yahu and Ardan on stage as well, uh, and Gregors, of course, uh, to discuss uh, what we have seen. Uh, I think this panel will be more of a discussion between the theory and the practice and how we get lost in between, no? So, when I listened to Dian's presentation, as I said, I like the, the way you structured why, what and how. Maybe we can start with why question, and if you don't mind, I'd like to open with Amin Manyahu. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm hardly pronouncing your name, but I suffer the same thing <laughs> as you do when I'm abroad. Uh, maybe you would like to start uh, with the why question and uh, why we have to invest in, in kids' infrastructure and services in, in cities, especially in mega cities. Uh, thank you, and uh, again, congratulations, Jens, on that beautiful publication talking about uh, process guidance on how to design our streets. And when we talk about why, as we are also working on a Streets for Kids manual, the question is that they form such a large part of our society today and the society that is going to be uh, managing our cities and our urban systems going forward. And it is very critical that we start with them because the minute we design our urban spaces, our mobility choices and our streets for our children, we've already made it foolproof for the rest of uh, the users on the street. So if you've designed for the 95 centimeters and their caregivers, you've uh, managed to make your streets and your urban spaces and public spaces safe and accessible to the children, to the elderly, and to the disabled. And then a lot of the able users like us are automatically going to fit in and be able to use it. But unfortunately, we've been designing it the other way around, where we of course, have been focusing on the automobiles and large concrete developments, and then we've been focusing just on the able-bodied human beings. So that is one big reason why we need to focus on kids. And the second big reason, which Cecilia also mentioned yesterday, was around thinking of our streets and our public spaces differently. We've often spoken about streets only as a mobility uh, corridor. Right? And that's what we've reduced it over these past few decades. But when we look back at historical settlements all around the world, streets were more than that. Streets were places to stay and play, and what we also like to say, they were also places for, to move and crew, right? That's kind of the motto that we use at NACTO as we uh, work on these projects. And can we bring that back to our streets, where no one wants to run away from pollution and from being hit by a car, but they want to be in those public spaces to stay, to be able to play, uh, caregivers with children, children with other children. And can the experience of mobility be more than just getting from a destination to another, right? Uh, you spoke about how in Tirana, it's almost like an archipelago of schools. So it's only about destinations. And when we redesign these spaces for children, we make these uh, places more as journeys, which can be jointly for, uh, they can be safe and accessible, they can be comfortable and enjoyable, and above all, they can be educational and in inspirational for these children. Can you quickly talk about your work at NACTO and the Global Street Design uh, Guide that you are developing, and then maybe relate to previous uh, presentations? Yes. Yeah. So uh, what we already have out there is a publication called the Global Street Design Guide, uh, which apart from this heavy book is also available for a free download. And it's kind of complementing to a certain extent what Jens uh, spoke about. And it, as Jens mentioned, it builds off a lot of work that already exists from people in this room and outside. But it's 
focusing a lot on design guidance. So if we take uh, the guide that Jens spoke about, talking about the process, then this is the next step to it, providing design guidance. And along with uh, Bernard Van Leer Foundation, Pierre Foundation, and Bloomberg Philanthropies, we're now working on a supplement to this. And we're creating what is the Streets for Kids. So it's a design guide which uh, starts talking about the nuances of how to design these spaces, uh, also building off the process on how to design these things. And a big part of this guide is to make it accessible to a wide audience. Uh, so we talk about informing our practitioners being the first big thing, because it's a technical guidebook which can inform architects, urban designers, planners like us when we're working on streets and play spaces every day. Uh, a very important uh, audience is the leaders. So it's about inspiring the leaders. So we use a lot of big case studies from all around the world where leaders can look to them for inspiration and be like, you know, if my neighboring country can do this, so can I. Because uh, there, alongside, uh, uh, there is a lot of healthy competition between cities and mayors that's happening today, right, where, with the help of media. And uh, the guide is one of those tools which we feel can inspire leaders for a healthy competition. And then finally, it's about empowering communities. So with a lot of pictures, simple images, and graphics, uh, we try to make these documents available to people through, of course, stakeholder engagement sessions like we were hearing about before, um, so that they can also demand more from their local councilmen, from their mayors, from their planners, and from their nonprofit organizations or others. Because we often feel a lot of communities in various parts of the world are not even informed about the kind of simple solutions that are possible just around their street corner. And that's the audience that the guide is catering to us. Thank you very much. Ardan, I'd like to continue with you. You're working at uh, Bernard Van Leer Foundation as research uh, analyst and you've been leading the Urban 95 Challenge, which was the first uh, global challenge that the foundation opened. So how do you relate to what Abin Wanyamu just said, uh, mentioned? Uh, do you think, do you see uh, similarities between implementing in the field, creating tangible results? Do you think they are replicable, they are scalable? I think that's, that's a very good question. Um, when we started the Urban 95 as a strategy two years ago, we launched this challenge where everyone could apply for uh, a proposal for a project and we selected in the end 26 projects out of 150. Um, and I think that was great to see what's possible and to see what mm -hmm. sort of things everywhere around the world um, can help how families interact with the city. But one thing that I think also resulted as a reflection on the challenge, is that many of these projects and many of the implementers who had the great best intentions try to make something that's perfect mm -hmm. in the city, um, which then doesn't translate to um, chances to scale it up or replicate it throughout the city. So it's, it's, there's, there's little thought about the, um, the costs and the effectiveness and, and, and how this can become a standard throughout the city. And I think what you said, um, with little things you can do a lot in these streets. And what I really also loved about the presentation from Simon and Novanda is that from the start they've already thought about um, um, that these practices should at some point become at city level, scaled up and, and, and um, spread throughout the city. And keeping that constantly in mind from the outset from the project, I think will make it really strong and, and, and will uh, give it a very high chance of of actually making it throughout the whole city and not only in one hotspot neighborhood where someone plotted a great little park or neighborhood or project. And Gravis, after listening maybe from theory to practice kind of slide, you're at the practice end of it, but yes. also teaching here at Kadir House. What's the, what's the, the, the difference, the level of buy-in, let's say, from the theory to practice when you get into the field? Yeah, I mean, so actually maybe I will not address the why question yeah, so no, much no, because no, I would no. actually much more want to learn from these guys. Sure. Uh, so I actually want to understand a little bit more what the problems you have been running into uh, while doing your work in Toronto. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so I think we, if we want, we just switch to the dialogue. That mm -hmm. would be, uh, mm -hmm. say, my preferred uh, uh, approach because I think yeah. you showed your progress, but I'm sure you had a lot of uh, obstacles along the way. Uh, um, I mean, I think um, the you know the, this question about how do you um, how do you mainstream? Uh, we started with a document uh, made in Vienna uh, by. By a woman, Eva. I can't remember her name now. She she she wrote it in 1996, and it's kind of it's it's very good, you know. But um, we're starting in 2018 um, from scratch, more or less, with these issues. And the question for us is, um, how do how does a city staff um, learn uh, first of all to value this as work, and then also to you know be able to get good at it, and what we find when we speak with the city is that you know they're very they're very enthusiastic um, in word, but they're extremely busy people from obviously the mayor all the way down to the kind of junior level urban planner is out of their mind with work because the city is moving so fast. So how could we possibly come in there and expect them to kind of learn this whole other? Um, approach, you know, which is also layered on top of their new master plan, which is also layered on top of their new green action uh, plan, et cetera, et cetera. So what we've been, that, that, that's kind of, you know, the, the challenge is to really, you know, the mayor gets it and his, his highest officials all get it and are super excited about it. But then that's, it's not just them, it's everybody else. So as soon as they leave the room um, to really um, uh, embrace it fully, and, um, and, and also, of course, enact it. So our, our question for us is just, um, you know, we think the, the, the pilot is such a good idea in Tirana now because we have to learn collectively how to build this, and then um, once it's there, to collectively understand what its values are. Um, because it's, it, it, again, it's, it's in the, it's in the uh, starter kit but that's the starter kit. And so we, you know, so. Okay, I'm, I'm asking because we will also start. Yeah. Similarly, sure. so we want not to repeat the mistakes that you know, other people have uh, experienced along the way uh, working from within the cities. Right on that. I think it's, for us, it's only the beginning. So we will face a lot more challenges as we go on with the project. But <clears throat> the first um, um, maybe challenge that it's, encountered is um, what someone is referring to working with the municipalities. There is usually a very um, high commitment um, from decision makers to, to do and have a vision, to do things that are in line of a certain vision. But then when it comes to practicalities of it, it's very difficult. And I think this, this is our challenge in um, maybe providing the municipal staff with a toolbox and proper indicators that can be very measured uh, throughout their work uh, and action plan. And this, is, I think, will be the challenge in the future and uh, trying to align this with the budget that they're trying to confirm for 2019. Actually, I want to go back to Jens. You, you showed the kind of escape from project to policy and you put all the steps in between. But what else do you think the implementers will need to actually pass from the project to policy? What, how can we support municipalities like Tirana and others around the world to follow all the steps actually from project to policy? Well, I think it, projects are very important. And I, I'm also, well, I started also my career in, in that way to build public spaces and then suddenly when they're successful you feel like it becomes part of a culture of a city in its, in its decision making but also in all its veins that public space becomes important and then there's also more awareness to have financing uh, dedicated for that from different sources and I think it also leads them to more capacity building but suddenly there's interest to also train people that then can take up that role in a in a city government to always play that role to build public spaces, and I think it's probably here the same. Like you have probably in a in a government uh, too little capacity at this moment to follow up 
on what you as a technician are pushing for. And so I think it's through the project that you should uh, try to find mechanisms that this is easily uh, trans translatable or also there's a immediate feedback possible that this becomes like kind of daily, part of daily management in the city. That's why I, I also made that variety of urban planning that it's very important to be project minded because that's where change happens. But you have to try to translate it to policy. For example, in policy um, environments uh, where, where you can you see like a sort of city government suddenly say like we have to have open data observatories. That's very important to have that name somewhere because it, it, it then means that there will be some kind of financing for this and some kind of technical assistance that clusters there and makes it happen. And that's, and that's the same with some things will probably also be translated in the land use plan of the city when it, the future will plan that developers, for example, that are building these neighborhoods that are now have been built without any school, that they will be mandatory to be, to be built. So it's very difficult in the beginning, but it's very, very, I think, very promising that it will lead to, to more structural change and that it then will be embedded in into a kind of continuous culture of, of good urban planning for children. Right. Just something to uh, ask almost of a question to Sandin and Albanda following on the project to policy part of it. A big challenge which we have seen after the guide as we have been working in various cities to take physical design into to policy, two big stakeholders that come in and uh, need to be part of the process uh, is enforcement, because you can design the most beautiful projects uh, and streets and play spaces, but in a lot of low and middle income countries that requires this guidance, uh, unfortunately enforcement is very poor, not leading to those projects being uh, used the w or perceived the way they are. And talking about perception, the second stakeholder is media and communication. Uh, a lot of these projects, there's always uh, someone who has something to went about it, or car drivers or others, and that is what gets most of the media attention. And they play a huge role in the success or failure of a project leading into a policy and its implementation. So are those things that you already started working on in Tirana or are facing, and um, also to Jens, if there's something in the process guidance about engaging with the enforcement and the media mm -hmm. stakeholders. Well, I, I, I also read your guide very, uh, very attentively, and I think it's, it's very interesting that it's, I would say, it's not just guidelines for technicians, because it also builds up very carefully that if you want to make it happen, that you have to have, for example, a kind of a platform of believers that are bigger than the end users and the technical experts, but that it has to be media, that it has to have tried to attract as much as people in interest, maybe the Chamber of Commerce, maybe schools, and, and, and so th you have to be very clever into building that coalition. Uh, and I, I'm sure that it's going to be also the challenge in Istanbul, which is a super big city. And so you have to be very clever, I think, to strategically use your locations, but also like them to see like how you can use this to really have a lot of echo uh, in, in the whole city. It's part of alliance building, and I agree it's not even only media. As uh, Cecilia also mentioned, it's academia. Uh, it's businesses and you have to convince many different actors in the city uh, so that they also more or less say the same things in, in their own environment because then it makes a difference, not always when we say the same things and so on. Can you comment on that a little bit? Do you have unconventional partners and alliances in Tirana, for example? I would like to comment on the first point oh. of uh, supervision and monitoring um, the the design, pro the planning process. And I hope that we'll come to a point uh, in Tirana where we have indicators, policy indicators that the municipality takes on in their action plan. And I think some of 
the most important indicators are monitoring the work and the intervention related to ITC. Um, otherwise, it's left to the planning part. Um, so we'll, I, we'll work a lot and closely with them in making sure that um, in a year we have a package of indicators that will hopefully be taken on by the municipal municipality. We have at the same time uh, an institutional um, coordinator that is um, interfacing with us as an organization and the municipality. It's uh, embedded in the institution and it's part of increasing capacities and uh, in the future I think it will be the person that will um, communicate uh, more closely with all um, department in the municipality on these issues. And on the second point, on communication, um, our plan is to be very active in raising awareness on, this sh on these issues um, publicly as well, through social media or other forms. But uh, for sure, it's a uh, very important issue. Part of the, I mean, the mayor is very media savvy, and so that that aspect, um, he, he's very good at communicating the importance of play, the value of children in society. Like that sort of um, that work is very much done, you know. I think, and it, it's very, um, it aligns well with culturally. It, it plays well, let's say, um, and um, I think so. Kind of, you know, our our goal though is to is to systematize those things. Um, in ways that maybe don't look as good on camera, or, you know, I mean, some of these things are less visible. It's not so bright and colorful necessarily. And I think um, part of this part of this work is to ensure that you know Tirana um, becomes more so, but also remains kind of leader um, globally beyond this mayor. You know, I mean, his his goal ought to be that uh, this is a legacy thing. So you know, he changed the city. No matter where he goes, uh, Tirana will become uh, and will remain structurally um, supportive of ITC, and um, that's that that will turn to enforcement down down the line. Um, I think the uh, for now, I think you know it's just sort of getting making public this this notion that not everything is is a uh, bright. Ball is a ball pit, you know. It's not ball pit world. Um, it's it's something much more, much deeper and somehow invisible. So that that's just it, that's a matter of time, I think as well. Thank you. Yeah, we have a question for you. Um, yeah, I think you mentioned that yet you had picked twenty eight projects uh, that you sort of wanted to highlight. But could you maybe if, were there any common let's say, threats in those projects, why you picked them, why they were successful, or let's say, what are the lessons we could, like, uh, we could take once the guideline is uh, or book is um, able to put down, they, they down there. Well, maybe I, I want, uh, yeah, it's difficult. I would say it more positively. Um, I tried to find practice that actually is not Copenhagen, I think. As I said yesterday, we don't want examples of Copenhagen anymore. And, and I really wanted to look at more examples in, in, in middle-income, low-middle-income countries, also, of course, because UNICEF works especially in these countries. Also, maybe to emphasize that uh, things are possible with little resources, and of course, there's a lot of, uh, and there's, it's also part of, part of innovation, that uh, social innovation, working with communities and children that have time is something super valuable. And, and that things can start happening with little resources. Um, and so that was a kind of filter for me. Um, I must say, like, where I would honestly also say where you could do a deeper analysis is, of course, that you could look now to these projects. Like, have they been upscaled? Yeah, I think it's also, I think the comment from Ari, like, you also are very close on the project that you initiate and that you also yourself wonder like how upscalable will they be. So I would also be intrigued to see more like how it has been taken up into policy. But I wanted to, I would say it's also a start eh, for UNICEF to make this book and to get into that area of 
talking with built environment specialists, urban planners. Um, but I think it's um, it's also how a lot of cities that now look like very well planned have started mm -hmm. uh, with tr trying things out, and it's going from waste management to better energy management. It's also always incremental that things happen, and maybe it's also. It, I think it's also a critique to give to a, a, a specific, I think there's still an attitude in development agencies that work internationally, I don't know, maybe you can also feel it sometimes to bring in um, very high level solutions, very, uh, for example, in road infrastructure, I think it's like big projects that are not always easily to define on a human scale and that, and that it's, actually not the way to go, that, uh, that it's better to also start small and, and then embed them into structural uh, urban management. Uh, I think in, in both presentations there's also a strong emphasis on the importance of data in the projects, um, but I think there's often a lot of data that these municipalities are already collecting and they are often stored only in the department that has collected them. And, and, and so there's not spread between departments and there's little awareness of what's happening throughout the city. Mm -hmm. And I think an interesting example is one of the cities that we also work in, uh, Boa Vista in Western Brazil, is where this hit the policy level. There they've directly, what they've done is looked everywhere globally what were the listed indicators um, that are relevant for children in cities and then check for all those which ones they've already had data, so the complete data um, inventory of their city, and actually resulted in a short list of about 40 indicators that are very relevant and were already collected by mixing and matching existing data of distances for caregivers with children to the nearest public transport and these kinds of things. And now through a dashboard, this entire city um, and all its departments will have access to these kinds of data. So I think, in addition to data and projects, I think there's a whole different layer of how these cities work and interact internally between departments. And I think it's not only about data, but it's also about the, the human side of interaction there. And um, I think that's also of particular interest. Um, in Tirana, I happen to know, um, that you also have a chief childhood officer mm -hmm. or something that is an advisor to the mayor mm -hmm. and what I'm aware of it's the only city globally that has this I think in addition to Tel Aviv so um, but maybe it's also an interesting thing to yeah. elaborate on. Yeah um, it, it, it's a it's a very interesting position um, you, you hear it a lot that you know in order to to um, push an agenda um, which may be new inside of a municipality it's great to have a person whose full-time job that is, so they can, they, they just, that's what they do. And in Tirana we have that. Um, and so this person um, is, uh, so far um, has been working on gathering data, and um, you know, she, she sort of goes around to all the departments, every desk, is like, do you have data? Nope. Do you have data? <laughs> nope. <laughs> and like sort of, then, then uh, the GSD students were working with her uh, a bit as well. And they were going to the national level, they were going to the parks department, you know, every, and, and slowly over a period of seven weeks, they, they really together gathered um, uh, what you're describing, which is data that sort of everybody had but never shared. And, um, that's been an interesting process because uh, through that she also meets everybody mm -hmm. in the city and now is kind of a figure mm -hmm. there. So um, you know, there we are. We are also um, very interested in sort of leveraging that role uh, for her to be the sort of public face of uh, us. And so we're, if we're the think tank, um, sort of in the background doing the research, et cetera, et cetera. She is embedded in the municipality. It become, she, she becomes the face of ITC planning um, on behalf of the municipality in a way that's much more um, sort of believable 
than if we were just, if, if it looked like the municipality had hired some outside who was like telling them, you know, no, it's, she's there and she's part of the team. Uh, and, and for us, that's going to be down the line really important in terms of communication. I mean, she should be in parks with moms, uh, you know, twice a week and on TV too, you know, at the same time. So like really just becoming this figure um, who um, is indispensable for everybody else in the municipality. If you're working on a pilot and you need to borrow the book, she has the book maybe, or whatever, you know, everybody should have a book. At least everybody has the URL. But, but she can become the resource. She has, I, ideally she would have an office with posters on the wall, sort of all the resources, and she becomes the kind of hub for this information that everyone um, goes to visit a lot, hangs out, lunchtime lectures, you know, it'd be really cool. You know, the best panel is where the panelists don't need a moderator, uh, <laughs> but I have to intervene. <laughs> the, the chat is going very well. And in order to balance a little bit the, the main domination of the, the, the panel, I'll give floor to the audience and priority to female voices in the room and be strict about questions, if I should repeat, yeah? Yes, Sarah. <laughs> uh, Jens, you started talking about uh, educating uh, planners. Uh, so this has been also, and since we are at Kadir Haas and we have this dream of, and hopefully it's not a dream anymore, it's a reality, of setting up a master's uh, program starting next uh, semester, what other in, uh, academic institutions are in UNICEF's uh, network? And uh, similarly to NACTO and similarly to Tiran, though um, we heard about Harvard, and also actually to Ardan, uh, like who, who are the players academically um, who are taking up this flag? Well, in my case, it's, um, it's actually very simple. Until now, UNICEF hasn't invested in urban planning or let's say also in city management. So there's no, there, they have a lot of affiliations, but then it could be with health, health, uh, health departments in, in universities. So I don't know if that's a, it's a, it's a logic step to work then with the same universities. Um, I think what we, we have to do is to set up like regional um, pool of expertise probably because we want to work globally to also figure out it seems like in our organization most uh, uptake will come in Southeast Asia so we should look into that area to find a good university that is in a way already linked with uh, children development but can also provide this uh, support on urban planning and then also Latin America is also interested. But I can't already say to you, so I'm also very open to hear any suggestions from anyone about that kind of topic. Uh, so for us at uh, NACTO, as we were producing the Global Guide and we're working on the streets with kids, uh, we don't have any official tie-ups with any educational institution, with two institutions that we leverage a lot of resources from is of course Columbia University and the John Hopkins School of Public Health. But something which is a very core part of, uh, was a part of this guide and we're working on that for the streets for kids is that it's not a guide that four of us sitting in a New York office produced, right? And that's very important. So we set up a global expert network um, and when we produce a global guide, we had about 142 people from 70 cities in 40 countries who were part of this. And the spectrum was equally distributed between practitioners, people from city government, and academicians. So we had global players from different academic institutions who were feeding information, reviewing this on a regular basis in order to help the guide become as local and as contextual as possible. And just one of the things that comes out of, uh, in order to make these guides and guidance uh, in terms of process and uh, design very applicable to these universities, what we've realized is to promote strategies and not projects. That's one of our big learnings from working with these academic institutions, that what works is when you suggest a strategy rather than a project. Any other question from the audience? 
It's a good crowd for a Saturday, I should say. I have a question. Okay. I was wondering, Jens showed a piece on air pollution, I think that's not been covered at all yet in this uh, conference. And, uh, well, Cecilia mentioned yesterday that the first child death, I think, in, in London was related to air pollution. Um, but yet it's not a subject very much um, um, addressed in the urban planning for families and children. I was just wondering, in the guidebook that you, you've been working on, did you also find particular niches or angles that are different from the children's perspective to the air pollution challenge globally um, that we could have an, a special additional role in, as in this sector? Well, I, th I think air pollution is particularly, uh, the, the, the child lens regarding air pollution is particularly very powerful and because it's very clear that they are the ones that are most vulnerable because they're small, they breathe uh, fast, the lungs are used and breathing is bad air and so there's a lot of uh, problems with development in the future life of a child. Um, and you see also, I think, globally that the leverage that then schools start to have as, as places where also pollution is measured, that this really uh, result, results in a big wave uh, of, of, of, of bands that are word, media that jumps on this, and that suddenly poli politicians have to react. So I think su supporting measuring the air pollution, communicating that uh, on, on with an open data, uh, mechanism with good scientists also because of course there's always this discourse of like is this scientifically true and we have to reanalyze this is very very important also so in the project in Antwerp there's also very good academic partners involved I think uh, that's important and then what I think that's important as a urban planner then to really show your added value that is that the solution will have to come from urban planning and, and transportation because the, making the, the statement or making that information um, uh, communicated is very shocking, it's very successful, but then it starts also the question like we have to act very quickly. And so I think there might be at a specific moment a problem that we have raised enough awareness mm -hmm. and that, for example, it's very high on the political level that the mayor wants to act, but then the mayor also expects that there are people, trained people, that come with solutions that can be implemented this year, actually. And I think that's also where there's a big responsibility, I think, mm -hmm. for urban planners to not only get the why question and be very mm -hmm. much focusing on that this is happening, but also come with good solutions, eh? like, like car low uh, school areas, mm -hmm. and that schools are also, for example, implemented in, uh, in situated in in a way that it's easy to make uh, um, areas that are that have no pollution. Türkçe de soru sorabiliriz. Hala çok iyi çevirmenlerimiz yukarıda bizimle beraber. Onun için e, Türkçe soru sormak da mümkün yani. Panelistler. If you'd like to ask questions in Turkish, it's still feasible. I just said. No. Hello. Uh, how should be the starting point in all these child-friendly actions be for implementation? I mean, for example, as a professional, what can we do? Or the non-profit should be make the action uh, by going to the municipalities or institutions should have some um, initiative on this. I mean, how can we start an action? Are you addressing to someone specific or in general? Whoever okay. wants to. Who would like to start? So I will start with this question. I think it's very important. And one way to do is how Tirana is going, where you have the political buy-in right from the top. And you start uh, from political will and you build strategies, projects, and policies around it. 
The other way as a practitioner, what we push uh, architects, engineers, and all the cities that we work with, is start introducing a little bit of this in every project that you do. So the next time you are designing a neighborhood, introduce some wider sidewalks, introduce fun play spaces, introduce a place to rest and to enjoy. The next time you're designing a street, add a bike lane to it, take away some space from parking, give it to space for children and their caregivers. And that's also a small way to start spreading this in the physical environment in an everyday project. Because sometimes when you want to sell this as a larger thing that I, we need to do this for children, it might take time, but you can start tomorrow by the next project that you're doing and introducing just a few square meters of space dedicated to children and caregivers, and that's the way it can go. And the more they achieve, the more they will be willing to do yeah. and invest, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think when engaging the community and, and, and looking at, and at the needs, do think about the different ages and the different needs. For example, in Jens' slide, you saw also the, the different needs of younger children and, and as they grow older. And it's interesting to understand that children from zero to five years old, um, they can be involved in community engagement processes. Maybe when they're four or five, but younger, often not. And, and the gatekeeper for them going outside is the caregiver. They decide if they go to the coffee shop around the corner or, or if there's time to go out or not. And just thinking about when are these caregivers available? Are they available during the day? Where are they available? So, so when doing community engagement, also thinking about different users and, and where you might find them and, and how you can actually collect those needs. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the temporary street closure. Um, I think it's, it's an extremely powerful thing. Um, and of course, uh, you know, depends on where you are and how you get your city to do that for you. But um, the, um, the experience of having no pollution, but also no noise from cars is something that I think we don't often consider. But um, especially if you can have it take place over a large area, um, the kind of silence that can be achieved in the middle of a city, especially on a weekend, uh, but even on a weekday, can be really, really transformative and gives a very tangible idea of a possible future. Uh, to people who live on a street. And I think that's really, really important when, when you talk about changing a city uh, beyond planning, beyond, beyond plans, beyond renderings, beyond any kinds of description, to be able to place someone inside uh, that space and have them experience it for themselves. There's kind of no way, uh, no better way to, to um, explain what, what could be. Joe in the room that mm -hmm. does that here, so maybe there is a moment to. And I'm sure our keynote speaker will also touch upon that. Yeah. Yes? Everything has been said, I think uh, it, it starts with um, changing the way you start the diagnosis, I think, and to also get people, children involved, to also use, use their way of viewing how a situation is. And I, I feel like for what, what I think is very, very important is also change participation or more uh, mold participation processes into urban planning. I, I feel sometimes the participation processes are set up uh, to talk with children on, on very abstract things to ask them, for example, what is your ideal world, etc. And that's very important, but you can also connect them with maybe very current, tang tangible street uh, shaped designs that are happening daily everywhere in cities and then it's much more tangible and you can also start engaging you into the production so that really they will own that space and also see the vision that they have uh, realized uh, in their childhood. And I think that's something where I feel like there's sometimes two different words about participation, children and urban planning. 
can be easily connected. Teşekkür ederim. Işık Kamaraş ismi. Marmara Üniversitesi'nde çalışıyorum. Bir müsaade edin. Kulaklıkları takalım. Tamam. Buyurun. E, i̇ki tane sorum olacak konuşmacılarımıza. Önce e, Tiran'daki uygulamayla ilgili. Acaba bu proje kaç yıllık ve sürdürülebilirliğini sağlamak adına zorluklarınız neler olabilir? Bize neleri aktarabilirsiniz? Çünkü biz üniversitede bir takım çalışmalar yapıyoruz. Belediyelerle, yerel yönetimlerle de çalışmalarımız var. E, bize ön ayak olabileceğini, yol gösterebileceğini düşünüyorum sizin önerilerinizin. İkincisi, e, çıkmaz sokaklarda oyun oynama ile ilgili önerileriniz ne, neler olabilir? E, böyle bir düşüncemiz var ama hayata nasıl geçirebiliriz? Önerileriniz neler, neler olabilir? Teşekkür ederim. Uh, things happen extremely fast in Tirana, which is so beyond the mayor um, being uh, a, a, a big advocate of this kind of work. Um, the city is extremely agile, and that's sort of the key to our uh, schedule. Is that you know he, the the um, yeah the, the apparatus can be kind of um, directed quite quickly, uh, especially in terms of like road works. Um, those, those are there. There are, and this is this is the you know. The, the kind of public participation processes around changing a street are not very strong or present. Uh, and this is, the, this is the other side of this. So, you know, it, it's, it's super important to, to make sure that uh, a neighborhood and a community is sort of on board with this, obviously. And that, I would say, is sort of the length of time that we don't fully understand at the moment. Once it's, um, once, once the green light is given, it, it can happen quite fast, especially with what we're talking about. In, in the zones um, outside of the core, it's not like there's any expropriation going on, or you know, it's like the, the, the, the streets are quite wide, the kinds of, um, the kinds of measures that we're talking about are, are fairly quick. So the idea is... Um, but to make it sustainable, I think um, it's important not to focus on ad hoc projects, uh, only. That's why by the end of the two year, um, which is the timeline of uh, our project, we want these measures to really be integrated in the municipal work. And I think that's the only way to make it um, sustainable over time. It's something that they want to work on and work together in building something that remains hopefully there in terms of guidelines, standards, or regulations, hopefully. more specifically around designing of play spaces at dead ends. Mm -hmm. I think uh, two parameters which we need to consider, the first is the context, right? Mm -hmm. What is around that dead end? Yeah, are there homes? Is there a school? Is there a park? Is there, or is it dead walls with nothing around it? Uh, and what are some of the immediate elements? Or uh, is it a dumpster or a parking lot like a lot of dead, dead ends being? Because that's going to play a role and the second is, you know, Alexandra mentioned yesterday about eye on the street concept. So it's about understanding that at different times of the day, at that dead end, is there some form of a caregiver even peeping through a window? Are there grandparents around? Or is it mostly uh, a community which only comes to sleep back at night and during the day when kids are playing, there's nobody around? So the eye on the street, uh, so the people using the space and the place itself, the context, will uh, play a role in designing the dead end place spaces. Thank you. I think also in response to these dead end spaces is the, the powerful use of tactical urbanism to try things out and see the impact and, and, and if people approve of the use. Um, in general, in the community use of streets, which are otherwise used by cars. Um, this a couple of examples, for example, one in Sao Paulo where all the shopkeepers in the street were very much against closing the streets because they were afraid for a loss of revenue. Um, but whilst it was tested with paint and 
and temporary uh, lock-offs, and actually their revenue went up because more people stayed for a longer time, while there was a better use of that space for particular times. And I think these kinds of forms, technical urbanism, can be really, really useful as a methods of testing something out instead of a, a permanent way of, of in itself. But as a way of testing something, it can be really powerful. Maybe one last question before coffee. Uh, three questions now. All right. Hello. Uh, well, about five or six years ago, there was there were huge protests here around Taksim, which is a public space, and this happened in many different cities in Brazil, for example. And at the same time, uh, research shows that, for example, in the United States, the cars are not something so much desirable for the youngsters. And living in down, downtown is something that they are starting to give value back again. So my question for you guys is, do you feel that there is a kind of uh, movement in society or, or a will in society towards what we are advocating for here? How, how do you see that society uh, is receiving the messages that uh, we are trying here to, to give or to... So communicate. General, general question, I understand. Question, yes. right. Who wants to shoot? It's more demand for a better quality of life in general, and more well being in the environment that you live in. So that's I'll give it a try as a moderator. In some of the cases, like uh, temporary street closure, we don't even think that it's feasible. We never saw it, like in front of my house, the, ha the, the street could be closed and I could take my kids out to play on a Sunday. We didn't experience this, but I'm sure once we, we do, we will never give up. So there will be more demand, the more examples we can create, there will be more demand for this, I believe. And I hope it won't become a big crash, like <laughs> a huge demonstrations and so on, but uh, an incremental change, maybe even from within institutions. Anybody? Yeah, just to cite an example from New York City here, in uh, not the best reason for a demonstration, but something which has been a very powerful tool uh, since the time of Mayor Bloomberg has been when there were victims which were identified by the city government who had lost their children in car crashes. And identifying those families to make a case to their neighborhoods, their communities in the city at large, played a huge role in allowing for the city government to what they call breach of privacy by putting in cameras everywhere for enforcement, installing uh, traffic calming measures and other things. And a lot of that was piggybacked on organized protests to a certain extent or sharing from the victims of parents who had lost their children. Um, I'm a big believer that uh, society can be shaped um, and that I know sometimes it sounds weird, but um, if you see urbanization doesn't induce automatically neighborhoods, for example, you know that they have to be shaped. So and as an urban planner, you probably understand, but it's also like you know that there's a continuous process of um, development happening economically, socially, culturally in cities. So developing an urban culture with children is also very important to make also them believe that change can happen. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's a disaster that a lot of children maybe doesn't see when they become adolescents and, and youth that there's no change happening. And also the leaders that they have, maybe the parents that they have. So it's very important to always try to be part of that of that change. One last question. That yes. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if you are working with psychologists at all in your projects, and if so, how do you? Um, position them, or more importantly, what do you expect from them? I think as much as psychologists work with urban planners, urban planners work with psychologists, but let's see how they respond. Well, may, may I 
Maybe you can actually say something about the behavioral economics a workshop that we held last week in Istanbul. Uh, yes, there are there are areas that, that we can include psychology because how you shape the space is sometimes affecting the behavior of people and there's a this is a new area we are all learning. Uh, but behavior change is a, is a long term issue and uh, it's not an easy one, so I prefer <laughs> to tell me to respond mm -hmm. if there are any answers, yeah? Um, we're, we're not directly, um, I think our, our work is very much informed by the research that has taken place in the world around us mm -hmm. and through our networks we're constantly being fed um, the kind of, the, basically the, the, kind, the state of the art of the understanding of, of this work and mm -hmm. and um, I think um, it, there's a lot of you know early childhood development science embedded in it. Um, we don't we didn't work uh, so far with a with a um, uh, sci psychologist. You mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. uh, we worked with uh, public health people in the in the fellowship. That was sort of the main uh, focus of the of the first fellowship, but. Uh, we definitely are very interested in kind of cross-disciplinary sharing, uh, and it, it's definitely important. Uh, yeah. But the Urban 95 strategy of the Bernard from there, we're quite actively looking at the behavioral science. Um, for example, in the Netherlands, there is a lot of green space and there are a lot of services, while the, the, the, the least well-off within society make least use of them. So there's, there's a big piece there of behavioral science, why people don't make use of the services that are actually there. Um, and in that way, we're trying to also incorporate that in, in, in projects and models by, for example, putting triggers um, signs in the street mm -hmm. with questions about um, about nutrition, for example, signs in the supermarket about um, about healthy foods, or um, signs in the street. In Athens, we did a project with signs in the streets with ideas for parents how to interact with their child whilst mm -hmm. on their journey. For example, word games, pointing games, mm -hmm. um, these kinds of things. Um, so I think there's that there's a lot of potential in, in looking at how people behave in public space and, and, and how they perceive the services that are available to them. And I can also mention, just to get into a little bit of detail, maternal depression, as mentioned yesterday, is a major problem that we face, especially with mothers with young children. Um, green spaces, uh, areas where they can go themselves and take their children is an important uh, factor to decrease depression and to cope with it. So I think there's quite a lot of intersection between these two areas and we should come more together with the psychology or put together urban planners and psychologists in the same room and see what happens, yeah? Okay, I said one last question, but yeah, another last question. Merhabalar, Virgül Berna Ayusal, ben bir anaokulu yöneticisiyim. Tamam, kulaklıkta kalın, teşekkürler. Evet, buyurun. Bir önceki soruya istinenden, o soru gelmeden aslında ben sormaya yeltenmişti. Çocuk gelişimciler bu projelerde ne kadar aktif rol alıyorlar? Çünkü onlar, evet 0-3 yaştan bahsediyoruz, 0-6 yaştan bahsediyoruz. Okul önceci ve erken çocukluk eğitimcilerinden de bahsedebiliriz. Onlar gelişim özelliklerine ve kazanımlara hakimler. Bu projelerde ne kadar onlar aktif rol, al rol alıyorlar? Ee, bir de dün sanırım İngiltere örneğinden bahsedilmişti. Kum havuzlarının e, bertaraf edilmesiyle ilgili. Biz de okulumuzda kum havuzlarındaki sterili, sterilizasyonu sağlayamadığımız için açık alan, öğrenme alanına çevirdik o alanları. Kum havuzuna ek olarak, emsal olarak ne tür e, alanlar yaratıyorlar kendileri? Ya da önerirler bizlere. Teşekkürler. Let's see if there is any answer for the two sandboxes, alternatives to sandboxes, any idea? Not really, maalesef cevap veremiyoruz. Peki, child development of this. I think there is no... Okay. That's a very simple answer. Do we need an alternative? Um, yesterday, Emily Silverman. Emily, are you here? 
Mm-hmm. Yes, Emily Silverman told me um, in Tel Aviv, the head of parks who heard me speak a little time ago about risk, uh, and we got talking about sand, and he uh, went back to Tel Aviv and told his team to start bringing back sand to the playgrounds in Tel Aviv. And there are now 50 playgrounds in Tel Aviv with sand. So the question about sand, it's often, um, um, it is sometimes sand is a problem, but often it isn't a problem. And you can make sand work. And there are risk fears, yes? There, are, there is a myth, there are myths about sand that you mm. cannot possibly have sand. It depends, maybe in your neighborhood, in your kindergarten, it may be difficult. But I'm saying don't just accept if someone says, no, you cannot have sand. Mm -hmm. Question, explore, maybe have an experiment and try a sand pit for a short time Mm -hmm. and see if there really is a problem with cats. Maybe if there is a problem with cats, you can come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. Sand is wonderful. We need more sand.